Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Adobe Live. Today, I am joined by Ron Timahin, a fantastic London-based photographer. And Ron, I'm so glad to finally, finally get to uh, have you on the show and uh, go you. through some of your photography stuff. So Ron, if you'd like to introduce who you are and the type of images you take, and then uh, we'll get to the admin of the stream and everything, and then we'll run through it all. Let's do it. Um, hey, everyone. So yeah, my name is Ron Timahin. Um, I've been a professional photographer for around, say, five or six years now, shooting commercial work, um, specialising in cityscape, landscape, um, travel, portraits, fashion, um, basically anything I can get my hands on, really. I love to experiment with different types of um, photography. Um, and yeah, I've been uh, blessed to become a Sony ambassador, so I'm now on a Sony Europe's team. Um, I've also published my first book, which is in stores uh, worldwide, which is incredible. Amazing. Um, and yeah, it's been a remarkable journey. And I'd just love to share with you all um, some of the tips and tricks I've picked up over the years. Um, when it comes to editing, what I would say is that it's an ongoing process. Uh, you consistently learn new tips and tricks that you add to your arsenal, um, which can really help develop your photos so um it's always good fun especially during a lockdown to kind of go over your old photos and re-implement some of the new techniques you've learned um the kind of overall layout of today uh, i'm going to show you a mixture of different photos that i shoot for commercial purposes and how i would edit those photos to make sure that they're the high standard they can be um it's going to be pretty in depth so hold on to your seats but i'm yeah. hoping that you'll pick up a lot of useful tips and tricks so yeah yeah so uh before we jump into that uh just a quick word on if you're watching the stream um we are live in a various different locations but if you want to join in with the chat then come and join us on behance we've got the chat active and uh all sorts of people in there um all catching up over the weekend because of course we are monday we are kicking off fresh for creativity and uh as ron said we let's not waste any time because you've already run through the amount of stuff you want to share with me yeah. and i'm excited for it because there's a lot <laughs> but yeah. um yeah let's let's jump straight into it cool um so this first image is taken for the swiss tourism board and um as you can see the photo is very underexposed the reason i've done this is because uh, i like to retain my highlights uh, especially in this snowy scene where it's very easy for the snow at the brightest point to get blown out. Uh, I'm, as I'm sure a lot of you know, it's easier to bring back shadows than it is to bring back highlights. Um, so that's why I've exposed it like this, basically. Um, so the first thing I'm going to want to do is correct the exposure. Uh, I'm going to bring it up. The way I like to know if my exposure of my images is okay is by looking at the histogram at the top. Um, if I see that it's quite balanced and nothing is being clipped like this, then I know that we're we're in we're in good stead around here. So I think somewhere around here works for me. Um, what I then like to do is head all the way down to the bottom and head down to lens corrections. Now, what lens corrections does is it effectively removes any um, distortion that might come from using your lenses or wide angle lenses. So I'm just going to click it on and off. A few times so you can see if you pay close attention to the edges of the image you can see that it kind of just corrects it it looks a lot better and uh, uh what so lens is this shot with originally this was shot with a zeiss 35 mil 1.4 okay um, i yep. love that lens like, yeah it's so sharp and clean love it. it's uh surprisingly lightweight i find that lens yeah. actually uh for That's given cool. its size it, it feels like it would be you know, a questionable addition to the camera bag, but it's it's actually pretty lightweight, I find. Definitely, love it. Um, so yeah, that already looks better. Um, what I might do sometimes is then head into manual and correct the purple defringing that might happen. Um, what that means is sometimes if you take an, an image in very bright lighting conditions, the edges 
um, of the brightest parts might have this kind of purple tinge. You might have seen it. So what I would do is then slide that up a little bit and it would just remove that. Uh, this image is fine though. Um, next from here is the white balance. So as you can tell, the image is very cool. And what I would really like to do is to warm it up. And especially on this right side here, I would love to give it the kind of golden glow that I, I thought I'd seen when I was there. Um, there are many different ways in correcting white balance. You can also correct white balance creatively if you like. Um, the main gist for white balance, if you don't know, is the colder you make the image, the more you want to move the tint slider to the left or the green to balance it out. If you make an image warmer, then you're going to want to move the tint slider to the right to compensate for that as well. Simple, that's how you do it, really. So there are three ways in correcting white balance. You can obviously go up into um, this section here and you can choose from some of the custom presets that are already there. And they an analyze your image um, and it will automatically do it for you. Or you can actually specify what type of shooting or lighting conditions you are in. And um, you can then adjust from there. So for me, this looks quite good. However, you can get even more accurate with your white balance correction. Just that initial white balance change has really brought out the the variance in the temperature across the image. So before, Definitely. obviously, where it's very cool and you white balance almost couldn't tell that the sun, yeah. Yeah, I think, so yeah, I, what I should say is these first three steps are really important and I would do on every single photo um, before I start going into any other adjustments. Um, the way I like to adjust my white balance, if I've got time, is to use the white balance picker tool here. So if you give that a click, you can then select somewhere on your image to take a sample of, um, and that will give you your white balance reading. Um, the easiest way to find the right place is to pick a neutral tone. So you don't want anything that's completely black or anything that's a color. Um, you want something that's kind of gray. Um, and you can check if that is a good reading so for example, this, I think this spot here, it's nice. It's sort of in the shadows and in the, the highlights. So it's a nice balance. If you look at the numbers at the bottom of this grid, I'm not, I can't really point to it, but at the bottom of this box, you see these numbers. You want those numbers to be as close to each other as possible. And that gives you an accurate reading. So somewhere like maybe here should be fine. Within like two or three of each other, I think it's okay. If you give it a click, as you can see, it's warmed up a little bit more. And for me, that's how I remember seeing it. Mm. What so, time of day was this shot at? This was at sunset. Okay. Yeah. So um, rushing back down the mountain. And yeah. It, it's the way it is, when you are when you need to leave, that's when everything magical happens. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Brilliant. I've had so, that in um, the past with, um, especially on mountain stuff, because you've there is like a safety element of when it gets dark, you really shouldn't be up a mountain. Exactly. Um, but as a photographer, it's just so painful because you're like that, you know, we are at the top of the peak and or maybe not the peak peak, but, yeah. you know, we're, we're at the top and you can see so much of the sky changing before everyone else gets to see it change. And yeah. um, like, no, get down. <laughs> so, honestly, it was killer because it was, it was a four hour hike up until this point. Oh, man. So we were there and we were not supposed to be there at this time. We were meant to be near the bottom because it was going to be dark, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't, man, I couldn't miss it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's the base corrections, um, and I'll show you a little before and after. So we've gone from that to that already wow. a massive difference. Yeah, definitely. From here is where the more fine tuning details come, I guess. What I've done is I've created a preset I've called it Run Source because I like to add my source in my images. <laughs> so lame, I know. Um, <laughs> And what I'm going to do, I'm going to run through with you guys what my preset entails instead of kind of creating it from scratch for you. So what I like to do, I like to reduce the highlights ever so slightly. These are kind of the global adjustments, right? So reduce the highlights slightly, the shadows, um, push them up a little bit just to bring back a little bit of detail. The whites I like to bring down um, just to retain even more details in the brightest points. And then the blacks I like to push up um, mainly because I, I'm, I'm a massive fan of film and I, I think a quality to film is kind of the faded blacks, the kind of smooth milky blacks. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll often push up my blacks. If you wanted to set your 
whites and black points manually, then you can do so. And there's a really neat trick to knowing whether your whites and blacks are accurate. And what you do is you want to click option, or I think it's alt on Windows. And while you're holding down this button, click the white slider and you can drag it left and right. Obviously the screen is completely black right now, but what you want is as soon as you start seeing these red dots, that's a good white balance point, uh, sorry, a white point for your image. If you want to set the black point, again, you do the same. You hold option or alt on your keyboard, and then you can drag to the left or the right. And because my blacks are already faded the way I've done them, they're not going to show as clips, but normally that's how you would do it. If you see any, again, red um, little specks, that's when you know your black point is good. I love so how we're, we're going into the, the true technicalities of this. I mean, I mean I'm just not a lot of people do that. So it's no Lightroom. Um, so I wanted to show a, a nice range of different things. So yeah. it's not for people just getting used to Lightroom and then for people who are a bit more advanced. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, for, for an image like this, um, if it's a landscape or a cityscape, I will often add a little bit of clarity. Um, around 10. I don't like to push it too much. Um, I remember when I first started using Lightroom, I got really excited by the slider and I was like, Wee! like all the way up. I to remember the <laughs> when the clarity slider came about uh, and the texture slider as well, very similar. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was, it, it was kind of one of those things of, I probably shouldn't touch this one. There's, there's a lot that could happen with this and I, I should be yeah. careful. <laughs> definitely, definitely. I think with clarity, less is more. Um, don't overdo it. It can make your photos look quite amateurish. Mm. There's uh, um, some questions in the chat about um, uh, letting an image clip. Do you have a certain tolerance of, you know, some areas you're happy to to let the highlights clip, or are you very technical on nothing should clip ever? I try not to make anything clip ever. Um, sometimes I will let it clip. I mean, let me see if I can show you an example. All right, uh, yeah. So to see if you're um, blacks or your whites are clipping, a very easy way to do that is by looking up at the top of the histogram here. There are these two arrows, right? If you give them a click, it will then tell you whether it's being clipped or not. So if I move the exposure all the way to the top now, you can see all this red here. This is showing that all of this is clipped um, and it's mm. lost data. You don't want that, basically. Um, again, because, because of my presets, um, I like to make sure that my blacks aren't clipped. I like to have them faded, so it won't show them on here, but um, if you drag it all the way to the left, it will show you, again, the red margins where your blacks are clipped. Um, there are very easy fixes to gener generally to stop your blacks and your whites clipping. Um, and a lot of that can be done using the tone curve, which I'll go into um, now. So let me just reset. I think that is what it's just. Fine. So I'm, I'm assuming the tone curve then is going to be where the real the real flavor comes from your run source. This is where the magic happens, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I can show you just how much difference the tone curve does by clicking on and off. This is without the tone curve. So you can <laughs> see how flat the image looks. With the tone curve adjustments, it's a, like a different image um, mm. completely. Um, and the tone curve is basically a way to fine tune the different um, kind of values of your image. How would you say it? Like the different... Um, let it's me like a, a granular control, isn't it? It's... Yeah, it's way more fine-tuned um, for contrast. Um, you can be very, very fine-tuned with this. Um, for those who don't know how to use the phone curve, uh, phone curve? Tone curve? <laughs> it's intimidating at first, but honestly, it's not that scary. Um, once you get used to it and understand it, you'll have so much fun with it, honestly. It's a game-changer. Um, basically, the tone curve, you've got the point at the bottom here, at the, at the far left of, this, um, of the curve, you've got your blacks. So these are the darkest parts of your image. So if I move this up and down, you can see that it's affecting the darkest parts of my image. As you can see here, look now, see it's gone blue, that's showing that it's clipped. Um, and that's because I've got these enabled still. So I'll turn these off for now. Um, but yeah, as you can see, if you pay attention to the blacks, that part of the tone curve is affecting that portion. So if you move further up, you then get to 
the darks, I think they're called. And um, if I add a point here and drag it down, you can see what it's doing. So you can brighten up the darks or you can darken them by literally moving the point up and down. Um, you've got the midpoint and this will affect the general exposure of your image. Moving up further, you've then got the bright parts of your image. And as you, if you pay attention to the snow and the clouds, um, you can see that it's brightening, brightening it and um, making it darker as well. And then last but not least, you've got the one at the very right top corner, and that affects the whites, the brightest parts of your image. And so if you are finding that your highlights or the brightest parts of your images are clipping, then you can bring this down ever so slightly and it will solve that issue for you. Um, but again, be sparing on this because <laughs> it could look quite weird. Um, cool. Hopefully that makes sense. That's like the base of how the tone curve works. If you want to add contrast, you can use an S curve. And now an S curve basically means um, you have a five point curve. So I'm going to add another two here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. And you want to create an S with this curve. So to do that, we're going to pull down the dots and we're going to move up the lights. And as you can see, it's added contrast into the image. Very simple. Um, I would start with there. For those of you who like um, film or the kind of tonal quality that film gives, obviously you can't replicate it um, using digital, but um, you can get somewhere that mimics it. Um, the tone curve I like to use for that is, again, an S curve. However, um, I would normally make the points into sort of this formation. So I'd bring the curves out a little bit. Um, so it's a, a curve sort of like this. So there's a bit more emphasis on the highs than the lows. Right. Is that, I hope everyone's still with me. Yeah, um, no, all good, all good. Yeah. So with your, um, you know, you can obviously spend days in, <laughs> in tone curves. You can have curves on curves on curves. Yeah. Um, I know you mentioned previously that you, uh, you take a lot of your work into Photoshop as well. Um, yeah. I think you actually said that previous to the stream, you didn't actually say it live, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, you cool. mentioned that you, you do your work into Photoshop. Um, of course, in Photoshop, you can have multiple adjustment layers and, you know, yeah. multiple curves layers and stuff. Do you find that your editing of the picture as a whole is always done in Lightroom or do you, do you cross over between, um, essentially, if you were to use Photoshop, what are your main tools for using it there? Um, so I use a hybrid of Lightroom and Photoshop. I feel like the majority of my editing, editing is done in Lightroom. I try and do as much as I can in Lightroom. It's a very powerful and capable um, tool. And so I'll use Photoshop for fine tuning. Um, I'm going to show you in a little bit anyway, um, some of the stuff I do. Um, but yeah, most of most of the heavy, heavy handed stuff comes out in Lightroom. For sure. Yeah. Um, cool. I'm going to keep it moving. Uh, the way I've done my my presets is to go into the different channels of the tone curve. So you've got the red channel, the green channel, and the blue. Um, and I've adapted these individual color color tone curves to get the contrast that I'm after and the kind of color balance. Um, what I would recommend for you all is to really take some time out of your day and sit there and just play with the curves, the, the tone curve tool, honestly. Um, as soon as you start practicing with it, it will make a whole lot more sense and you can create some really compelling um, and interesting tones to your images. Um, so this is kind of how I've laid mine out. As I said before, the tone curve that I like um, follows this kind of film S curve. And so I've just replicated that within the different channels. Um, there's also another way to adjust your tone curves. If you um, are finding that a little, little bit too confusing, or you want to add a little bit more contrast to your curves or fine tune them a little bit more. If you click the far left um, icon here, you can then have sliders here, which you can play around with and you can change the tonality that way. Cool. That's tone curves in a nutshell. <laughs> um, from here, I now go into color correction. Um, in short, the color that I like to adjust my colors um, individually. I don't try to adjust everything globally too much. So I will normally just leave the saturation at plus five. Um, I won't I won't play around with trying to make the oranges more orange 
by mm -hmm. using the saturation sort of slider, I would like to go into that specific color and tweak it that way. Um, a very easy way to do this, um, which is an amazing feature, is this little icon here, right? So I'm not even sure what you would call that. Do you know what that's called, Joe? Uh, I guess it's technically like an eyedropper. Okay, cool. So we'll call it like a, a color eyedropper. Maybe. Or a pipette. <laughs> but what, so you're, you're picking it up cool. rather than dropping it down. So Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, what's, um, what's really cool about this is that if you click it, you can then hover over the color you want to adjust and you can click and drag up or down and what Lightroom will do is automatically detect which colors are in that portion that you've selected. So whereas before I might have chosen just orange, if I'm moving the sliders, you can see it's affecting the yellows as well. Um, so this is a very, very easy way to kind of color correct your taste um, just by sliding and dragging. So yeah, I'd recommend doing that. Again, um, less is always more. Um, a good friend of mine, Toby Shinobi, says it's like seasoning some food, you don't want to over-season, you don't want to under-season, just get it right. Yep. Um, and the more you eat, the more you know what you want to taste. I like that, yeah, see? Perfect. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the base of it. Um, again, go through and play around with these sliders, create something that you're, you're happy with. Um, and I'll go into color grading in a minute, but um, we'll head down to sharpening. Sharpening, I tend to leave at 25. The default is 40, but I also do a little bit of sharpening in Photoshop using a different method. So I only like to sharpen it ever so slightly in Lightroom, and then I do the rest of it in Photoshop. So that's why it's on 25. Um, noise reduction, I think this image was shot ISO 250, so I'm not gonna touch the noise reduction. I think it's okay. Um, and so that's the base of my preset, right? From here, I will then do local adjustments to really give that extra kind of source on the image, right? So if you want to save your presets, what I recommend doing is um, heading heading to the preset panels um, on the left-hand side. You can give the plus a click, create a preset. And then from here, you can choose which um, attributes of your preset you want to save. Um, I recommend leaving white balance and exposure unchecked because this varies so much between each different photo. Um, if you're batch, batch editing, um, say a series of images for a client where you're, it's all shot in similar lighting conditions, then yeah, give them a check. But I think for general purpose presets, leave those unchecked. Um, and this is just kind of how I like to save my presets basically. Um, I won't do noise reduction because again, that's image specific and the transform and lens corrections I'll leave off as well. There's a, uh, a great mention in the chat of um, one thing that's found useful between Lightroom and Photoshop is when you're in Photoshop, you can create your adjustments and scale them back with the opacity of the adjustment layers. Um, and likewise, the same with uh, the presets. I'd, I'd love that ability to scale back how much of a preset you're applying, almost like a, um, like a scale between the before and after of what's being applied. But Unfortunately, that's not capable. Yeah, oh man, that would be incredible. I mean, I know we've got profiles now um, mm. that some of you might have seen. So if you click up here, you've got um, different profiles that um, work differently to presets. Um, I'm not going to go into detail of those, but definitely check those out because you can actually save a profile, uh, maybe a tone curve that you like, and then it won't affect any anything in um, these panels here. And you can, again, change or tweak. But um, yeah, there's so much you can do in Lightroom, honestly. It's amazing. Yeah. Cool. Um, right, so I'm going to really quickly go over the, the kind of new color grading. Um, this is a, an in-depth image. The next ones I do will be a lot quicker. So I'm just showing you start to finish kind of what my, my overall process is. Um, color grading, I like to look at color science um, and use complementary colors. So um, as you can see, the shadows are cool and the highlights are warm. So I'm just going to emphasize that a little bit more. Um, I'm going to bring the color slider, the color wheel down to the bottom a little bit. Again, I don't, I'm not heavy handed with this at all. Um, and I'd like to warm up the brighter parts of the image. So I'm going to move this to the orange side a little bit. And again, something like that. So as you can see, without color grading, it looks like this. With color grading, 
it just changes the overall tonality a little bit more. Um, and it kind of adds a mood to your image, I think. Uh, if you find it hard to see and work with these color wheels like this, then you can go into the individual ones. Um, and that's a lot easier to work with. Uh, you can also change the luminance, which affects how light or dark the color values are within that. I like to leave those. Um, and then you can also play around with the blending. So the blending is how evenly the colors um, merge together. You can then also change the balance. So if I wanted less blue in the shadows, I can slide it to the right and the image will be warmer or to left. You get the gist. Um, for this purpose, I'm going to leave it at zero. Cool. Now I like to go into even more local adjustments, right? And these tools at the top of um, the panel here are so, so powerful. Um, what I'd like to do with this image is just to really enhance this kind of golden glow on the right hand side. And so I'll use the radial filter for this. The radial filter is really easy to use. Um, what I like to do for a sun flare is to draw a really big kind of radial filter to mimic that kind of sun. It's huge, you can tell it's massive. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what I would do from here is I would, I think invert makes it in the middle. Um, it affects the, the middle of the circle um, more than the outside of the circle. So um, I would bump up the exposure. I don't like to go more than 40 um, or 0.4. Um, I find if I push it more than that, it can look a bit fake. So about 0.3 is good. Um, and I'll then warm up the white balance a little bit. Um, and to compensate again, I'm going to move the tent slider to the right. Um, ever so slightly, there you go. Something like that. Might even bump it up a bit more. Um, and so you can see without the sun flare, I'm with it. So again, it just adds that extra, extra mm. kind of contrast and dynam dynam dynamic to it. I keep looking at this image and just thinking how great a print it would make. Have you printed this? I've not. At all? You know what? I've not. I need to do this. Yeah. Um, all right. We're going to leave it at that for this one in Lightroom. Now, what I do from here is I'll right click and do edit in Photoshop 2021. Um, the benefit of doing it this way instead of um, exporting it and then importing it into Photoshop is that you retain a lot more detail in the colors. Um, this is because as soon as you export something in Lightroom, you, you can normally export it at 8 bits. Um, but in if you transfer it to Lightroom, it retains in a TIFF format, which is 16 bit. Um, it might sound really technical and stuff, but basically what that means, 8 bit has, I think it's um, 16 million colors. And then 16 bit has, I think, 28 billion colors. Yep. So you want to keep as many of those colors as possible when editing. You don't want to lose any of that stuff along the way. It's all really, really useful stuff. That's basically it. Um, I'm going to breeze through this bit. What I like to do um, in Photoshop is um, to add contrast. As you can tell, I didn't add any contrast in the slider tool in Lightroom. I do it all in Photoshop. And then I also add some sharpening as well. So we're going to sharpen first. To do that, I use something called the high pass filter. Um, and what that does is it effectively sharpens just the edges of your image. So what? So it leaves out anything that doesn't need to be sharpened. Only the most important parts of your image get sharpened. Um, and I find it a nicer way to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate the layer by pressing, pressing Command or Control J um, or dragging it to another new layer here. Um, and then what I'll do, I'll go up to Filter, go down to Other, and then go down to high pass. Now, as you're gonna see, it looks weird. Like, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense right now, but if you zoom in, you can see all these little um, grooves. These are all the edges. So it's an edge detection filter, right? It's detected all of these edges and we're gonna sharpen those edges. Um, when it comes to the radius, I like to keep it somewhere between uh, one and 1.5. Um, you can play around with this um, slider and see what happens. If you move it up, you can see it detects a lot more edges. Don't go that high. It doesn't look good, honestly. Just um, I like it around 1.1. Just keep it nice, subtle, and clean. Um, click OK. And then from here, we're going to click Overlay as a blend mode. 
and then that's it that's literally all, all it takes to sharpen nice that's a that's quite an old school method as well but i love that you're um you're promoting that because a lot of people wouldn't maybe know of that method but that is very common for uh for print related and then other steps onwards to that would be like adding grain and stuff do you ever add grain to your images yeah i sometimes do so after this process sometimes i'll save it go back into lightroom and add grain then um i like grain i think it yeah. adds a bit more life and soul to an image i think yeah, it's one of the things that is is missed so much from digital photography and digital grain. Again, it's not always the same sort of replacement, but it has gotten better. It's one of those weird things. I'm sure there's a team of people just working on grain, yeah. um, but it's uh, it's you know sometimes a, a digital image can just look too clean. Um, you say it a lot in yeah. video where you know just. I don't know, things just look very digital. Um, and then you get digital cinema cameras that are replicating the the levels of film. But it's, yeah, it's one of those things that once you've experienced film and then you go on to digital, you'll spot it immediately. And then it's trying to find that balance between the two. Exactly, exactly. Um, I, th I think I'm going to start experimenting with film again, um, just because I love, I love the quality it brings. Um, yeah. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Um, so yeah, just a before and after of the high pass filter. So it's very subtle. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see that. So this is without it. It's a lot smoother, but then when it's clicked on, you can see it's just sharpened it ever so slightly. Um, and then when you do print that big, it's going to be so much more, um, defined, but yeah, so that's what I do. Um, to add contrast, I like to add contrast using a black and white adjustment layer. Um, again, it sounds fancy and stuff, but guys, honestly, it's really simple. Um, the way I like to do it, I click, um, this button here. What's, what is this called now? Um, forgot, my mind's gone blank, but basically give that a click. Um, the adjustment layers. Adjust, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what would I do without you, Joey, honestly? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so click adjustment layers, head to black and white, and I'm going to turn the image black and white. From here, I'll then change the blend mode to soft light. And what that does, I think it just gives it a more natural um, contrast, right? This is obviously way too much contrast, but I'll normally take it down to zero and then bring it up ever so slightly. And I think what that does, it just gives um, a nicer gradient with the contrast. It also doesn't boost the colors as much as, say, a contrast slider would. Um, when you ask add contrast, it normally saturates the image a bit more as well. Um, so I just prefer to do it this way. Um, I think I have more control over the, mm -hmm. the contrast. Um, cool. And then last but not least, I might go into um, color balance adjustment and um again just emphasize that warmth so i might move this to the yellow side a little bit again move it to the purple slightly um shadows i might cool a little bit just a touch and then highlights again i'm gonna warm up a little bit just to bring a bit more there something like that um cool i'm gonna leave it at that but this is without the Photoshop adjustments, and this is with Photoshop adjustments. So it just adds again that little bit of um, seasoning. Yeah, <laughs> yep. all the toppings. <laughs> cool. All right. So that's. Um, I mean, from here you can merge the layers, and um, if you save the TIFF file, what's great is it will then automatically save back into Lightroom as a TIFF file. Um, it takes some time, but. Once it's back in Lightroom, I'll then add some grain um, just to finish it off and that'll be it. So that's um, start to finish an image. Um, hopefully that made sense to everyone. Yeah, no, I think that, that covers a lot. Um, just a thought there, if that's a, a process that you're finding yourself repeating multiple times, uh, mm -hmm. it's definitely something that could be created with an action that you could then go and tweak and adjust afterwards and uh, make your fine adjustments. Definitely. That's the next step for me. Yeah. So um, create that Photoshop um, action just so mm. you can automate all of that, which would be a lot quicker, especially when you're shooting kind of commercial work. The turnaround time is often really quick. Mm. I find. So um, all those minutes really, uh, minutes saved editing really does count. Yeah. Um, cool. So that's a land, uh, landscape image. I'm going to do um, a cityscape image really, not quickly, but again, just go through the same process. Um, Speed round. <laughs> yes. One of the um, 
most important tools actually in Lightroom and in general is the crop tool, um, which I didn't use in the other um, the other image, but I want to show you in this. So things that annoy me right away with this image, right, is the the dead space on the left hand side here and on the right hand side. I don't feel like this image needs that there. It's not saying anything. It's not doing anything purposeful. So I'm going to crop out those parts of the image. So I'm going to just crop out the sides. And as you can see, it now focuses your attention straight to the shard. Like I like how it just kind of contains everything. It looks nice. Mm. Um, I also love that this is an image. Um, one of the things that I really like advocate for is you don't always have to go to the top of a building to take the best vantage point. Um, yeah. I don't know if this is potentially the top of this particular building, but the fact that it's mid-level on the opposite buildings, yeah. um, there's something about looking flat through a cityscape that I just love so much. That's true. I've never thought about it like that, but yeah, spot on. Um, yeah, it just yeah, it makes you feel like you're a part of part of mm. the cityscape a lot more than just being above it. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's like with um, like the Eiffel Tower. If you go up there, um, I think you have to pay extra to go to the top level. Yes. And I've done it a couple of times, and every time I just find myself spending about five minutes up there, and then I go down to the mid level because I just yeah. prefer the view. <laughs> That's the same as me. I did the same thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you go to Mont Montparnasse? Yep. That, so, yeah, so yeah, that's that's a, a a big feature on my Paris list of uh, best viewpoints. Nice, yeah, the views from that's amazing. Definitely. Um, all right, cool. So, I've cropped it. Now again, the first steps. We're going to go down to the bottom, um, and we're going to change the lens corrections. Just get rid of that distortion. Um, we can remove chromatic aberration if you want as well. Um, one thing that's really cool within Lightroom um, is the transform panel. I didn't touch on that on the last one, but um, to straighten your image or to straighten any lines, um, these are really powerful tools to do so really quickly. Um, so I'm going to click auto. And as you can see, it just sort of straightens out the image. Um, I'm not sure if you saw that. It was yep. a ever so, so slight. Yeah, ever so slightly um, levels out the lines. I'll show you on another image that will be a bit more um, defined. But um, yeah, if you do find you're shooting an image and the lines are all skewed, then that's the place you want to go to. Um, cool. Uh, white balance. After well, we've got we've done exposure. White balance. We're gonna check auto. See what that looks like. Um, I remember this image being a lot warmer. Obviously, it was shot at sunset as well. So auto has done a pretty good job. Um, I think it's a little bit too green, so I'm gonna move it to the magenta side a little bit as well. Um, that looks alright for me. I think that's fine. Uh, okay, from here we're going to add the run source preset, and from here, um, as you can see, the whole tonality of it's now changed into what I I like personally. Um, I'm going to bring down the highlights a little bit more, just to retain a bit more detail in these buildings here. Um, I don't like how much data is kind of lost or blacks are lost in this bit here. It's kind of moody, but I want to bring back a little bit of that as I can. Um, with shadows and highlights, I tend not to go above 40 again. Um, I find that's a nice sort of range. I don't want it to look too HDR, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, I might even boost the exposure a little bit more. Because uh, it's a building, I'm going to add 10 clarity. Um, and then all the rest is how the preset was, right? Um, I'm going to go into like the most important part of this image. And what I like to do is um, add vignettes. Is it vignette or vignette? I think it's vignette, right? Vignette, yes. Yeah, it's vignette. Cool. Um, but what I like to do, there are, three, there are three different ways of adding it in Lightroom, basically. Um, one way is to head down to the post crop vignetting. Um, and what that does, it just adds it just focuses your attention on the center of the image, right? By darkening, darkening the outside parts. Um, it's a great way to do it if the if the subject is in the very middle of the image. Um, but what I like to do is I like to use the radial filter again and select what I want as the focal point of my image to be. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to reset this. I'm going to draw a radial filter over the shard, because that's what I want people to be draw drawn to. Um, I'm leaving the invert um, uh, box unchecked because I want to affect everything outside of this radial filter. 
and I've got the feather to 100, so I want it to be really smooth. And then from here, what you can do, you can bring down the exposure, and as you can see, it's adding um, a kind of more refined vignette on the shard. Um, again, I'm going to leave it about 0.4, um, just to draw your eye in a little bit more. I think that looks good. Um, we can then also add another radial filter. And what I want to do is add another sun flare. I like the way the sun is hitting the buildings, but I want to emphasize that a little bit more. So what I'll do is I'll draw, um, again, a big radial filter here. Like what we did before, we're going to click invert. So it affects inside of the radial filter. We're then going to bump up the exposure, maybe about 0.4, add some warmth. Um, I might go, yeah, something like that. Add a little bit of um, magenta back to it as well. Um, and so just with this, if I show you what it looks like without the radial filters, as you can see, your eye is looking at the buildings on the left. It's looking, at the, it's looking everywhere. But as soon as you add these kind of local adjustments, your eye really focuses where you want it to go. Mm. Um, so that's the power of going into detail with the stuff. Um, what I would then do, I don't like how there's this glow on the right-hand side of this building. I think I really want to make sure the focus is on the shard. So what I would do is I would then, while still clicked on this radial filter, I'd go into brush and then I'll click erase. And then what you can do is you can then fine tune what you want the radial filter to affect. So I don't want any of this to be brightened up or warmed up. Warmed up. So I'm just gonna paint it away. And just like that, it's done. So that way my eye is still focused on the shard. It's not focused on that part of the image there. Um, and as you can see, again, before and after. Lovely um, stuff. I've been trying to work out which building this has actually been shot from. The whole time I'm looking at it, because this is the like the Liverpool Street cluster, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, um, and I can't, I can't see the gherkin in the image, but I don't know if you're from the gherkin because nope. the gherkin's got like odd window frames. It does, yeah. And is that it's the Heron Tower in, in front, in the center? It's it's a building next to um, Liverpool Street, basically Liverpool Street Station. It's a law firm, right? So, um, this was actually shot for the law firm. That's why I was there. Oh, so this um, is the view from their office. That's the view from their office. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's not even like you're representing, hey, we're a big city firm. It's like, no, we are a big city firm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> literally. Um, so yeah, that's one of the benefits. When I shoot for clients and they've got wicked views, then it, I'm just like, thank you. Nice, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you mind just letting me have uh, 10 minutes to get my own images over there? Yeah. <laughs> some, some, some clients are actually all right with you doing that, if you ask. Um, you don't ask, you don't get, I think. Mm -hmm. Um. Cool. So moving on, I'll take that into Photoshop, et cetera, et cetera, um, and just kind of follow that process again. Um, one thing I want to show, let me see if I can, I'm looking at the time now, um, want to show something for you guys. Right. Let's go on to um, a portrait image, right? So this is something I shot for uh, Canada Goose out in Newfoundland in um, Canada. And um, one of the things about this image is that I didn't want to, I, I tried to expose for the sky. However, the sky is still nearly blown out. Um, I mean, if you click this, you can see that there are parts of it that are blown out. Um, bringing down the exposure, you can see there is some detail in the sky still, but obviously the model is really dark and that's not going to fulfill the purpose of what I was there for. So um, a way to affect just the brightest parts of the sky is by using um, what you'd call the graduated filter. And a graduated filter works by, uh, if you drag and drag from the top and move it down or from any direction you like, <clears throat> where you started the click from, um, this is going to affect, I believe, 100% um, opacity. It then goes into 50% opacity and then to zero. So it's a nice fall off. I think if I can show you um, a mask, you'll see what I mean. So this is what um, the filter is going to do to your image, basically, what it's going to affect. Um, what I like to do now with highlights, it's a really neat feature. Of course, you can then bring down the highlights and do it this way. But if you want to be even more detailed, you can actually affect just the luminance or just the color of these ranges. And what I mean by that is if you click 
um, at the bottom here where it says range blast, head to luminance. And then you can change the values of what you want this um, graduated filter to affect. So for me, I want just the sky to be affected. I don't want the darks of her hat to be affected because they're already quite dark. So what I would do, I would show the luminance mask. As you can see, this is what it's affecting. I'll move the range up um, of the black. So as you can see on a hat, it's now disappearing, um, but it's still affecting the sky. So I would do something like this. And then that way I know I'm affecting exactly what I want to affect really. Um, we could go even more, but for time's sake, I think that's fine. We'll turn off the mask and then we'll reduce the highlights. Um, you can even reduce the exposure as well if you want. Um, and there you go, like your skies are back. So simple, um, so powerful. If it's still clipping, um, which it doesn't seem to be, which is good, but then I would go into the tone curve and then flatten the highlights a little bit. Um, another way to bring drama to your skies um, and bring back some definition is to use the color um, adjustment panel again and go into luminance. Now with the luminance, you can again use the color picker tool and um, you can drag on the blues up or down. And what this means is you can either brighten the blues or darken the blues. And if you darken the blues, as you can see, you bring a lot more definition back into the sky. So that's just a neat trick. If you want to kind of bring some emphasis into your skies, go for those. Cool. Are there any questions or? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we're um, kind of all talking on the uh, the graduated filter and uh, the luminance message is uh, is definitely, um, when was that added? Like two years ago or something? Uh, yeah. Yeah, but I, I loved it when they added that. That was like a, a massive feature. Um, it just really gave you so much more control to um, to really select like certain areas. Because before that, if you had to brush things out, uh, it just gets a bit boring, doesn't it? it is very <laughs> <laughs> so true, so true. Um, cool. Now, there are different ways in using the luminance um, adjustment. Sorry. And I find a way you can do it with skin, right? So obviously we all know about dodging and burning. Um, I'm just going to make some really quick adjustments um, to Aldo. Aldo is an amazing, um, amazing man. He's uh, ex from Royal Marines. And now he um, he escorts film crews around the world in the most dangerous parts of the world. So oh, wow. he escorted the Narcos team in Colombia. Um, he's been on the edges of volcanoes and stuff. This guy's he's literally actually... Wow. <laughs> so someone you you would feel safe being up a mountain at sunset when it gets dark. Yeah, he's awesome, honestly. Um, cool. I'm just gonna add my preset. Um, for this one, what I wanted to show was how you can use the luminance adjustments to even out skin. So, in fact, the skin's quite orange. I'm just gonna desaturate that a little bit. What, um, so what I would do for this is I would use the brush tool, right? And I would paint generally over his face. This is such, it's such a lazy but easy way to dodge and burn, basically. Um, and you can see the, the mask here. Again, really rough, right? What I would then do is go into range mask, go into luminance. And I just want to bring the highlights down a little bit, right? So what I would do is I would show luminance mask. And then I'm going to move the shadows up. So you can see what it's affecting. It's just affecting the brightest parts of his face. Mm. Um, take that off. And then you can bring down the highlights ever so slightly. And as you can see, it's now smoothened out the highlights of his face. Um, I would then do the same again. I'll click a new brush. Um, again, draw roughly around his face. You can, you can do this um, a lot more accurately when you've got time and whatnot. Um, and now I'm going to do the opposite. So I'm going to do a luminance um, mask again, but I don't want to affect the highlights. I just want to affect the darker parts of his face. So I'm going to show the luminance mask, um, something like that, should be fine. And um, then you can bring up the shadows a little bit. And as you can see, his face is smoothened out. Just to show you how much it, it actually helps, if I turn this off and on, you can see how much it changes the kind of tonal features of his face. Um, and then you can add um, some contrast back in if you want to and sharpen the eyes and whatnot. But I find that's a really quick way to smoothen skin out. Um, 
when it comes to skin, skin can take a lot of time retouching. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll show you on an image of Marcus Rashford that I took for Vogue. Um, Just casually dropping that in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that was that was crazy. Like I can't even explain how how surreal the whole thing was. But this yeah. was over the summer, right? It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, wicked memories. Um, but yeah, another time. <laughs> um, so yeah, one thing. Sorry, sorry, Marcus, man. I'm gonna have to use you, but he's got some blemishes on his face. Um, a really easy way to do that in Lightroom is to use the spot removal tool. tool. Um, it's really, really simple. Um, you literally just resize the spot removal tool for the spot, give it a click. It automatically detects what part is most similar to this part you selected, and it will just automatically get rid of them. Like, I mean, the technology in this stuff is mind, mind blowing, Joe, isn't it? I don't know yeah. how they do this, <laughs> but, um, yeah. So if you are finding someone's got, um, some problematic skin, that's your lifesaver right there. Um, there are ways of doing it with, um, have we got time? Yeah, a little bit of time. Um, with things like telephone wires or fences. Um, and again, it's really simple to do. You use the same tool. Just going on there. There we go. Um, I'm going to convert this to black and white and crop it really quickly. Uh, say it was going on Instagram, it would be four by five. So let's. Let's do something like that. Um, things that annoy me instantly, right? I don't like this wire in the front. So I can do this using Lightroom, no problem. Um, to do that, you have the spot removal tool. And now all you have to do is resize the removal tool um, by scrolling up and down your mouse wheel. And then you can draw along that line, right? Something like that. It's automatically going to go into the text and it's done. Like it's that simple. So you can see where it's copied it from. It's taken the layer above and then mimics it below. Um, be careful. Sometimes there might be a little bit of um, discrepancies as you can see on the legs, but I mean, for time, I'm just going to crop it out. Done. Um, what even what was would... that? Was it a, a fence or it looks like it, a trip hazard it, <laughs> for yeah. children in fog? <laughs> in fog as well, yeah. Um, no, it was an exhibition, an art exhibition. So it was the kind of fencing around right. it. But yeah, that's that's dangerous, man. I just realized yeah. it. Um, cool. Uh, as you can see, there's a little spot here um, from the water. I'm just going to get rid of that. Um, what I would like to do with this image is to just balance it out a little bit. I find that this building here in the back is quite distracting. Um, you're, I don't think you're able to do an adjustment like this in, um, in Lightroom. I think it's too big of an area to kind of auto-correct. So this is when I would take it into Photoshop and do it there. Um, so again, we're going to edit in Photoshop. Remember retaining all that color detail. How long we've got? Seven minutes. All right. Um, yeah, sorry, this is a bombardment of everything. That is great. So many different point. things and yeah, just going through details. Because the, the thing we have to remember is that everyone's always at different levels. And sometimes, you know, you can jump into something and although it's great to see amazing images, things get skipped over and you don't realize you know the yeah. the basics behind it and the the details um and every so often they're just little nuggets of knowledge that you're just like dropping off and you're like oh that was uh that was a great little thing on top of you know explaining the full breadth of it yeah i think it's just um when you understand how a tool works you can realize that you can use it in so many different scenarios and you can yep. use it for things that it wasn't actually designed for but it works very well um cool so i'm gonna duplicate this layer so an easy way for you guys to remove objects in Photoshop, it's so, so simple. When I found out about Content Aware Fit for the first time, my mind was blown. I was like, what, is this easy, really? Um, so what you want to do, you want to use the lasso, las, lasso tool, lasso tool um, which is this one here. And um, you just want to draw around the object that you want to remove, really simple. So I want to get rid of this, this building here. I'm going to do it very roughly, right? You can then go into edit and then you go into fill and then in the content setting here you make sure you have content aware fill selected make sure the opacity is 100 and click ok um, and normally it works pretty well um, photoshop will kind of identify what 
um, you want removed and it will just do it. Um, give it some time. I think the bigger your selection is, the longer it takes to do. Um, it was a shot on a, you, you shoot with the Sony A9. Are you still on the A9? I've got the A9, yep. Um, yeah, I think which is a, a shot on 45 megapixel or something, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. massive. I love, uh, man, yeah, Sony boy through and through. <laughs> um, you had a chance yeah, to try the, uh, the A1. Sorry, just going off topic here. Oh, the A1? Oh, mate. Um, yeah, it looks insane. I think I'm going to sell my A9, my A7 R3, and just go for that. Because it's, it's everything in one. It's got the A7S3 capabilities as well. Um, the price tag is steep, but... Yeah, I don't know. It's an investment, you know. It's a professional piece of equipment, so definitely um, do that. But yeah, as you can see, the overall composition now looks a lot better now that I've removed that. Um, Content aware feels really simple and easy to use. Um, if, well, not if. When I've got this printed, I don't want any branded logos in this image at all. So I would also come down to here and remove the Vans logo, um, and I can do that by using Lasso tool again. Um, you can use either the freehand one or this one that I'm using now, but simply just draw around uh, the kind of item. Uh, a shortcut for content aware fill is shift F5, um, but I'll show you guys again. So edit content aware fill. Oh, this is a different way of doing it, actually. Yeah, I was going to say there's, um, there's the extended way with uh, menus, which has also been uh, Sandrine has mentioned in the chat uh, gives you a few more options and you can kind of see the befores and after and um, again sometimes like this one's a, a little bit more complex so it might benefit from extra control and options I think yeah that's true um, there's so many yeah so many different ways I find that if I'm I'm trying to remove signs on buildings especially um, in a symmetrical shot this is amazing because you've got the the mirror um, effects here and it can mirror one side of that selection to the other and just get rid of all of it um i mean i'm just going to do it very basically for now um just this way click ok this normally works sometimes you might have to try again um or just tweak it ever so slightly but as you can see it's it's done it's like a pretty it's good job yeah so simple um yeah, there's a, there's a lot of love for uh, content aware fill. It's one of those things uh, also yeah. been mentioned here. <laughs> Just don't tell the client how easy it was to do. Yeah, <laughs> it's so true. Um, but yeah, powerful, powerful tools. I hope that's um, that's all right. I've got so many other things I can show, but I think... Um, yeah, no, that's uh, right. Bang on time. Um, yeah, that was a, a fantastic run through uh, of some... Yeah, great images there. Can I just see the um, the Swiss image again? Just the before yeah. and after, because that we went through in, in most detail. Um, yeah, for sure. I just, that before and after was quite transformation. So this is after everything, right? Um, let me go back to the before on this image. I'm just going to reset. So we've gone from this wow. to this. So you can see how much... Um, how, like if you shoot raw and you understand how to edit, how much detail um, you can bring back into your image. So, yeah, you definitely need to print this. That is worthy <laughs> of a, a big <laughs> wall you. somewhere. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful image. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. Run. Also, really quickly, um, yep. it's a tweaking process, right? So, if you're not happy with something, it's non-destructive in Lightroom, so you can go back and change everything. So that's a massive plus. Um, definitely. But yeah, Ron, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today, uh, and thanks for everyone in the chat for joining along. Um, so we've got uh, some extra streams. So what is it today? We are on Monday. Uh, I lose track of the days these days. Um, so coming up this week, uh, we've got Tony and Tim uh, doing a title sequence masterclass in After Effects on Wednesday, and then on Friday we've got some portrait photography uh, with Tara Rooney and Sophia Emmerich, and. Uh, yeah, I'll be back again next week. Ron, hopefully we can have you back again uh, at some point. You've got so many great images to share. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, hoping for that foggy weather soon because I know that's your favorite. Mate, soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, just to, to follow on, there's also a, a Discord channel for those of you who want to continue the chat for Adobe Live. Um, go and join on Discord and uh, yeah, 
general day-to-day -day creative catch-ups and uh, there's a great little community here so thanks for joining ron and uh thanks for joining everyone else and we will catch you in a future one real soon cheers everyone <laughs>